Hello everyone, Ron Ray here from Down Under in Australia and we're joined today with our special guest Daniel O'Connor. Um, before we start, just a quick introduction. Today we're going to be talking about the warning signs from heaven and why they're being ignored. So Daniel's going to be talking about all the signs of um, the coming of our Lord and how we can prepare and He's also going to talk a little bit about this great delusion that's happening and that that's in um, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, which I'm going to read. With all the wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who do not believe in the truth but have pleasure in the unrighteousness. So stay tuned, everyone, as we discuss this topic. Daniel, thank you so much, and Happy New Year. <laughs> thank you for joining happy, us oh, again. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you for having me. Honored to be here. But you misspoke, Ron. The special guest today is not Daniel. It's Christopher. We got Christopher here as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Right. Christopher's, Christopher's our regular co-host now with Debbie. So I think most oh, of okay. our audience okay. know Christopher. So oh, yeah. um, you're always our special guest, Christopher. So. Would you like to start <laughs> off with a? <laughs> would you like to start off start us off with a prayer, Daniel, if you don't mind? Absolutely, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. In the divine will, we come before you, O Lord, and ask, especially that you bless all of us, Ron, Debbie, myself, Christopher, with your words. Please borrow our lips that we may glorify your name. Please draw all souls to yourself. Mitigate the chastisements. Hasten the coming of the kingdom of the divine will on earth. And give us the grace to all fulfill our own missions that you have planned out for us for all eternity. As we pray together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saints Timothy and Titus, pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, Invoking our saints of the day, but I suppose you're a day ahead of us there, Ron. So I don't know. I don't know whose feast day is on 27th. It's but. morning still here. It's 11 a.m. Yes. in Brisbane. No, oh, okay. So still, here in New York, I'm ahead of you, actually. Eight, yeah. so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're all, yeah, you're we're practically day, already in the era of peace there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. Oh, no, quite it's a bit we have to go again. through before that, isn't there? <laughs> sure is so daniel so, today the um title for today's show the warning signs from heaven are being ignored um mm -hmm. one of the reasons why i chose this title was because of the video you had posted up on your channel about that um eucharistic miracle and i felt that that's a very powerful sign and i would like you to maybe just have a bit of a ch chat about that sign and the other signs that that maybe being ignored yeah. there's so many signs that god is showering us with graces and, and in many cases downright miracles and i'm not saying i can prove that that particular video is, is definitively a miracle but it's certainly one of just so many signs that heaven is giving us today and yet people still have the audacity to almost shake their fists at god and say what where are you why aren't you doing anything do you even exist there some people can't figure out if they don't believe in god or if they're angry at him for not existing all sorts of contradictions going on in their minds but this, um, this refusal to see the signs of the times, not only the, the miracles he's sending and the graces, but also just looking at what's going on in the world. And as our Lord admonishes, observing the signs of the times by the light of faith. Remember, he condemns the Pharisees because they can, they can 
they can guess the weather by looking at the clouds, but they can't, they refuse to see the signs of the times. And what did they refuse to see? They refused to see Jesus Christ, God incarnate there in front of them. And we're also refusing as a, a, a the whole world, but too many in the church as well, are refusing to see the signs of his coming in grace among us, his, prepara- his preparing of the faithful for the warning, for these this great apostasy. He, he's The graces are there for those who want them, but too many are rejecting them and turning their backs to them. So, I mean, there's so many, I mean, there's so many different ways. And of course, heaven's messages. So many in the church just want to write it off completely. And I understand, you know, discerning living seers is difficult and I'm not demanding anybody submit to any particular living seer with with certainty or anything, but just private revelation in general, even so many approved, fully approved apparitions, so many of the faithful want absolutely nothing to do with it as if it just doesn't matter. So the God is going to try everything he can, but we're getting close to the time where he has tried everything he can. And then he's going to have to send the warning. And many people, unfortunately, they're not going to be ready for that. So what, what I'm just incessantly begging people is to get yourself ready, get your, get yourself ready, your family's ready and everybody you can ready by evangelizing like never before in this window of opportunity we have. We've got a window of opportunity right now because a lot of the tyranny of the last couple of years has faded. Almost all that has faded. The next great tyranny, it hasn't fully started yet. But if you look at what's happening, you can see that it's coming. So where are we? We're right in between these two things. And it's like God is giving a bit of a pause in these chastisements that we're already entering into the beginning and seeing what we'll do with it. And I'm begging everyone to make the best use of it as possible. Yeah. But this, uh, I, but I, you, sorry, you, you were, I, I went on a tangent there. I didn't even fully mean to because you were asking about particularly Thessalonians and this great delusion, this great deception, right? Or, but with yeah, Chris, if yeah, you had something that's else, that's the that, that I read. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say I think you're I think you're spot on. I think, um, like you said, it, th- that that new tyranny hasn't come yet, but it's it's right on the threshold, and we're we're looking at it in the face. I mean, it's gonna be here before we know it, and so many mm-hmm. people are gonna be caught completely off guard, and they're not gonna know what hit them. Um, mm-hmm. And and exactly what you mentioned too, as far as the warning which is coming, like God has done what He has can what what He has been able to through the merciful route, but there's, there's coming that time of justice. It's going to have to come like that, that has to follow. And we're, Mm -hmm. we're right there. Um, So I I always love how you talk about like, it's, it's the greatest time to be alive, you know, in human history. Amen. Amen. It really is. It's so exciting. It's a very, very crazy, but exciting time. The time, these times are the envy of saints where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And you just think about how, relatively few people know these things just pa- just pause to think about that in the, in the morning you wake up you probably didn't you probably weren't happy about the fact that your alarm clock went off <laughs> this morning i know i wasn't but but just pause for a moment and think wow i am among the incredibly few people on earth and this is not a this is not about being prideful or arrogant or anything it's just about gratitude who knows I have. I don't have to wonder why I exist, and I'm saying this to all Christians now, especially. Just, I don't have to have these existential crises. I know God. I know He came to Earth. But then, as a Catholic, you can say, "I know that He founded a church. I, I have access to it, the saving sacraments. I can have absolute confidence thanks to that." But getting even narrower still, if you're striving to be in the faithful remnant, we never want to have a chip on our shoulder about that, or just assume our own uh, the state of our own souls. Of course not. But if you're striving, if you're striving to be part of this faithful remnant. Maintaining orthodoxy, you know, sticking with the catechism, no matter what craziness is going on with whatever bishops' conferences are saying in Germany or wherever else. Sticking with the catechism, praying the rosary, going to confession, you know, doing your best. We're all miserable. I'm a miserable sinner, but you know, trying hard to be a part of that faithful remnant. Think about how you are like the elite of the elite of the elite of God's fighting force just by the fact that you're trying to do that. You're like the Navy SEAL, not the Navy SEAL. You're like, um, you're like, what is it? SEAL Team Six? I don't know. Whatever the most elite <laughs> force is on, uh, on uh, in, in the in the whole armed forces. So, take a minute to just give thanks to God that He's given you this knowledge. But don't don't um, rest too long in that gratitude because I mean, yes, remain grateful. But then that's got to become action to try to get the word out, invite other people into this remnant because soon, only those who are in that remnant are going to. Um, they're only, they're only the only ones maintaining their sanity, basically, with what's coming soon. 
but thank God he's got well, some special, special graces, you know, and I, mm -hmm. I would only add to that, Daniel, I, I, I do feel that gratitude. I really feel that gratitude, not only mm -hmm. for, you know, the gift that I'm a convert. Uh, I didn't become an, a Catholic until I was an adult. And um, so, you know, I could have been left really out in the cold. I, I pray for our, our uh, uh, separated brothers and sisters all the time because, which I think we need to keep them in our prayers. Uh, they, they're not privy to so much of this uh, information um, mm -hmm. because it's, it's uh, you know, it, the, the faithful, as you said, it's the faithful in the church who really understand our communion with the saints, our communion with everyone who who is inside the church and particularly those who are you know understand that that this is a this is a calling this is a, this is a time when we have a calling um to be faithful to be persevere to um to really pay attention to what's going on and um and be grateful not fearful but be grateful um, because mm -hmm. God has chosen, <laughs> I always say, you know, where God has chosen us for such a time as this. So, yeah, this was I, a time. Don't ever wish that you were born in a different decade or century. This is the time He chose for you. This and he is will the, give and, you grace. Yeah, He'll give yeah. you super abundant grace. I, I always go back to that quote from Jesus to Louisa. He says that in, 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 in undertaking His will, and by the way, if you're trying to do God's will, you are doing his will. Those are synonyms. Because if, if, you, if you could sincerely try to do God's will but still not do it, that would mean God is not good. But God is good. Therefore, and so don't, you know, do continue to discern to try and find out his will. You'll grow in knowledge of it. But if you're sincerely trying to do God's will, sincerely, and I can't read your soul, so I don't know if it's sincere, but you know if it's sincere. If you're sincerely trying to do his will, then you're doing his will. And he tells Louisa that when, you're, when the soul is doing my will, I am forced not ontologically he's God, but in a sense he's forced in accordance with his goodness to give super abundant graces. But he tells her, and anyone who's heard my talks and stuff has probably heard me quote this before, he tells her he only gives those graces when you actually set yourself to do his will. He doesn't give you those graces when you're sitting in your room thinking about doing his will. Because then you just start, you just start high, getting yourself anxious and worried and fearful, and then you wind up just not doing his will. He says, I'm not going to give you the grace at that point. Because then you might not do my will anyway. And then that would be wasted grace. And I don't do useless things. When you set yourself to actually do his will, you'll feel yourself overwhelmed with grace. It'll be easy for you to carry it out. That doesn't mean that there won't be suffering involved. But the grace to bear the suffering will far outweigh the suffering. You'll actually, su in, in that sense, in an in a, in a ontological sense, you'll suffer less in doing his will than you would by just staying at home and trying to stay comfortable in your own little nice little world you've crafted for yourself. You can do so much for him right now. You can, I mean, think about in ages past where if you wanted to be a missionary, you had to abandon your whole life and family and everyone you've ever known and get in the ship and go across the world. Today, you can be a missionary, you know how? By walking out your front door. Unless you're in, 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 in like one of those very few perfect places on earth, you know, like, uh, I don't know, Steubenville maybe, <laughs> but, uh, but or Ave Maria, Florida, I don't know. A few nice places where you're not necessarily on mission territory and you walk out your front door. Everywhere else you are basically in mission territory, walking mm -hmm. out your front door. So be that missionary. Be that missionary of the divine mercy. Now is that that window I, I talked about before. It's the window for proclaiming the divine mercy and the divine will, accepting God's mercy and striving to live in his will. If we can get that out there, we are ourselves prepared for what's coming and we're preparing other people for what's coming. But uh, if, if we just waste this time by just pretending, OK, you know, COVID's over, the tyranny's over, I can, you know, life is back to normal and I can I can just uh, go back to my old ways. Man, you're missing the opportunity of a lifetime. You're missing the opportunity of history right now. God, God's going to act. And he'll do what he he'll do what he has to. But, but right now is the chance to build up those treasures yourself. He even went one better, didn't he? And he said he told Louisa, he said, um, you know, um, those people that don't take the graces all the uh, all the leftover graces <laughs> i'll mm -hmm. even give you those <laughs> mm -hmm. i'll give you mm -hmm. those I, i'm gonna i'm gonna shower you with graces if you stay yes my will, do my will ask god for the graces those are rejecting him because there's a lot yes. of rejected graces today you yeah, know yes. definitely and we're going to need the graces to, to resist this this thing coming soon. Is that and i keep sorry i keep kind of veering away from that accidentally but ron <laughs> were you saying something there 
No, you continue was that to resist uh, what's coming around the corner, you were saying. Yeah, there's these deceptions, they are stepping up and stepping up like I never would have imagined. I've been warning about these for a long time, but suddenly it's no longer speculation. It's just you check the news and it's what's happening. And there's, I don't want to overstate any, I don't want to say that there's just one great deception. I think there's, there's all the various enormous deceptions today. They all have the same goal. There's, there's all sorts of different deceptions, but the, the goal of all of them is apostasy. They want you, they want to draw you towards completely rejecting God. As the catechism said, I don't have the quote in front of me, so I'll paraphrase it, that the Antichrists, uh, he'll present a, a solution to this, some crisis, to mankind's problems. But there will be a simple, there will, there will be just one small little caveat that will require apostasy from God. We know, of course, what's going to go along from, with that from the book of Revelation, the mark of the beast, this mysterious thing whose number is 666 and it's a mark in the right hand of the forehead. Revelation is specific about this for a reason. There's no, yes, there's symbolic interpretations and those are valid. There's all sorts of valid interpretations of, you can have 10 different interpretations of one scriptural passage. And as long as they don't contradict each other, they can all be valid. But this is also, this is a passage in scripture that has a very clear indication that the literal meaning of the words is true there's going to become there's going to be some sort of a mark otherwise scripture wouldn't have been so clear that it's the right hand or the forehead and we're suddenly seeing this infrastructure for it being set up before our eyes and this is as we said in the beginning people are ignoring what's the 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 warning signs the warning signs directly from heaven but also seeing the signs of the times in the world you never could have imagined in a previous era, all buying and selling, being coordinated centrally, every man and woman on earth, man, woman, and child on earth, being incapable of buying or selling anything without this mark, this, this mark in the right hand or forehead. But suddenly it makes perfect sense. The, the, this was fringe uh, speculation just a couple of years ago. And yet suddenly now, if you just Google it, almost every country on earth is preparing the, their own central bank digital currency. It's like Bitcoin, but uh, moderated not by any private entity, but by the government itself to replace the official currencies now that still are paper and, and a few nations, maybe still gold and, or silver backed. But it'll be purely digital. And how will you access it? Well, through your smartphone, of course. And that's how it'll happen in the upcoming years. This is going to roll out. They seem to think this will roll out over the next year or two. These central bank digital currencies, you'll be you'll have to use them through your phone. But. You know, you know, that, you know what's going to happen then? And this here is not my speculation. This is what the World Economic Forum just said a few days ago. Maybe, I don't, I'm sorry if you, if you reported on this already in the channel, Ron. I'm not sure if you did. Oh, but not yet. They, okay, so this, they said there's going to be a global cyber attack within the next two years, basically. That's, and they wouldn't have been that specific about it if they didn't have it all planned already. They're not going to say, okay, yeah, two years. It's because they know it's going to happen within two years because they're planning it out now. Why would they do that? The, the reason I think it's clear, and I, spec, I, I wrote about this in 2018. I said, I think, and I, this is my, now this is my speculation. I could be wrong. I'm not issuing a prophecy here or anything. I think that once central bank digital currencies become sufficiently, uh, sufficiently established in our economy that they're considered necessary for the economy to continue functioning, I think that once that happens, now probably within the next year or two, then there's going to be this massive global security breach. Security breach. It'll be blamed on <laughs> Russia or who knows who it'll be blamed on, some hacker group. But it's going to be intentional. It's going to be the central banks and the World Economic Forum doing it. Why? Because this will be their false flag. This will be their excuse. They'll say, I'm sorry, you know, we need these central bank digital currencies now. We can't possibly survive without them but they are too insecure now to use through just your phone. The apps, we've looked into every possible, every possible solution. The only possible way we can keep this secure is a biological way with a chip physically in your body that is unhackable, untransferable, and all that. That's when they'll require the chip, I believe, in the right hand or the forehead. Now, this is, it's going to go along. And this is heavy speculation. I don't know how exactly this will be, but it'll somehow go along with apostasy from God, this, this uh, chip. And that'll become clear in the days ahead, especially how 
its number is 666. We'll have to leave that. We'll have to just remain cognizant of that as we observe the signs of the times, because I don't have an answer for exactly what that is. There's endless speculation on it out there. But that'll come. It will entail an act of apostasy from God. I'm not saying you're going to go to hell just because of a chip. I mean, please don't get a chip in you no matter what. But there's going to be this rejection of God along with that. The infrastructure for it is already almost completely laid. They're just waiting for the circumstances to be right. There's Absolutely. I, I think, yeah, I think it's spot on. This just reminds me of something I saw. I think it was just a couple of days ago where Dr. Yuval Nawari had a video out about infotech and biotech merging together. And that's exactly what this chip system and, and this whole infrastructure is set up to do. It's infotech. So they're watching everything you do. They're tracking your data. They've already been doing that for years, you know, through the social media, your search history, all of that stuff. So they're taking the infotech and they're going to merge it with biotech, which would be something like a chip or something similar. And, and when those two things, when those two technologies merge, that's exactly what you're talking about, that kind of capability with technology. And I think we're, we're right there. It's, I mean, they're already out in the open talking about this, how it's already doable, how they plan to implement it, um, why they think it's necessary to do so, all of these things. Like, they're not even hiding it anymore. Well, they don't like, even try right? to hide it anymore. Yeah, it's just in yeah. the open. He doesn't even, he doesn't even try to be sneaky. Yeah. No. Out there, you know? yeah. They don't need to anymore because of how no. addicted everyone is to their technology. They know that we're now at the point where 99% of people just won't give it up no matter what it entails, even if it entails selling their souls to the devil. Yeah. Yep. That brings they, us so back. They, they're going to be great. more and more open. Yeah, the great delusion. and this great deception. So yeah, this its end goal is deception, always apostasy. Yeah. But yeah, there's many different, and and this is you know Saint Paul prophesies here in Scripture, so we know it's we know it's a sure prophecy that this is also a punishment for our rejection of God. This this great delusion, and we got to be careful to distinguish between God's ordained will and His permissive will. He never He never affirmatively wants people to be deluded, of course not. But in His permissive will. Kind of like, you know, Satan having that dialogue with God that Pope Leo XIII saw about the hundred years. And you know, we, I hope to do more writing on when that, on that, well, I shouldn't get sidetracked now, but, but I got a video coming up soon. So <laughs> on some of that stuff. So check my, check my YouTube in the next couple of days or something, a few days, hopefully. But um, this, this, in his permissive will, he can say, okay, you guys have rejected me enough. I'm going to allow Satan to do this. I'm not doing it myself, but I'm allowing it. And this, the greatest deception, the gr it's going to be a test of some sort. And that's why you can't necessarily assume that it's something that's going to be specifically, uh, you know, word for word condemned in the magisterium in the clearest possible sense. You got to just stick with the traditional Catholic faith here, really, the tr traditional Christianity, which is Catholicism, certainly. <laughs> And I speculate, looking at what we've been primed for for so long, that at least one major aspect of this, I'm not saying this is the entirety of the great delusion, but a big aspect of it, at least, I think, is coming to a head through this alien phenomena. We talked yeah. about this in my, on our last, um, I yeah. can't remember if it was our last video in here or not, or a couple of months ago, last, but think, yeah. if you look, the, this great apostasy, what's going to serve as a catalyst for it, like nothing else in history, there have been all sorts of apostasies throughout right? history. Of course, now we're coming to the great apostasy itself. But what would what would serve as a catalyst for that, like nothing ever before, is a revelation from, quote, heaven, an angel from heaven, a so-called angel from heaven. I'm speaking symbolically here, not literally. An angel would never do this. But this supposed revelation from heaven of a new gospel, a contrary gospel that just transfixes the whole world. It just, just, just enraptures them in a diabolical way. What is the single thing that has been more presented as what would be an epoch era world altering thing in the bad sense of the word? First contact with the extraterrestrials. They're the elite. And this is going to have, I believe, a demonic element to it, but also just a uh, global elite element to it. There's a lot of it just, yes, I think demons, the aliens, I think they can be demons in disguise. But also, I think in many cases, it will be just deceptions of a hu of human origin whether holograms or or drone shows it's amazing what they can do with drone shows now um or just manipulated media lies in the mainstream narrative if people see it on tv and they'll believe it because tv says so and this will lend authority this these these more evolved beings so these so-called more evolved beings which don't exist 
but they'll be said they'll be said yeah. to have this new wisdom and we finally made contact with them and they say they say do this and this and that and this other thing you'll never shake hands with them you'll never you'll never have dinner with one of them because they don't exist there are no aliens but you'll be told that there are and there will be various false lights and signs and what the antichrist will bring all sorts of false signs and wonders that will delude many and this will lend the quasi spiritual aspect to the reign of the antichrist i think he will be either him he will be presented as either himself an extraterrestrial neighbor or at least one who has contact with them who who can share their teachings maybe this is why i'm just asking this is getting this would have sounded crazy some years ago and yet suddenly in just the last couple of years this has become mainstream the 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 uh cern the large hadron collider in europe just recently said oh yeah we made contact with beings from another dimension this, they, they, this is as mainstream as you can get. We've got congressmen saying these UFOs are extraterrestrials among us. We've got major Catholic pundits who should know better saying this. There are people, and I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not excluding any any dignity from this. There are including priests and theologians, priest theologians maybe. There are people you would, never would have dreamed would be problematic and they will be some of the greatest promoters of the great deception they'll say oh no this is fine this isn't contrary to anything dogmatic this is this is um this is good this is this was always god's will no you've got to just say no to that it will be demonic there's nothing in the bible there's nothing in the catholic faith there's nothing in private revelation that gives us any grounds for believing that this could be good or real or true it's a deception. I think one of the biggest aspects of the great deception. But I, I do want to emphasize just one aspect of it. The, the, the devil is going to throw everything at us in the times ahead. The alien stuff, the A, he's, going to, he's got big plans with the AI nonsense as well. We've got more and more people thinking that AI, which is just a bunch of zeros and ones, you could build any AI software on the planet out of Legos. And yes, it's very problematic. It can, we have to be very careful here. But it's just a, a machine. That's all... There's no such thing as artificial intelligence. Only God can create intelligence. It's software. All software is transistors and diodes. And all transistors and diodes are logic gates that either allow electrons to pass through or don't allow electrons to pass through. That's all it is. It can never have a soul. It can never be sentient. It can never be alive. It can never have reason. Only God can make those things. But you know what they're going to do? And they've been priming us for this for decades as well. Just look at what Hollywood's been doing. They've been giving us robot after robot after robot since Star Wars that is supposedly supposedly a person or rational. And some of it's innocent entertainment. I'm not condemning all, all that stuff. I'm just saying, look at what they're priming us for, just like the alien stuff. We're gonna be told <clears throat> that chat GPT or whatever it's called, we're gonna be told suddenly, oh yeah, that's, that's actually a person. You can go to it for wisdom. And you know what it's gonna start doing? It's gonna start doing what the Ouija boards do to foolish little girls mm -hmm. who start using them. It's gonna be a channel for demonic directives because it's not a person. <laughs> Only God can make persons. And the devil loves to hide. He loves to conceal his demonic communications with souls under other guises, because then you don't know to reject it. You don't know to say, be gone, Satan. You don't know to say a prayer because you think, oh, I'm just dealing with another person here. No, you're not. If it's a supposed alien, if it's a supposed sentient AI, and it's doing things that only a person could do, that's a demon. Demons are persons. Angels and demons are persons. That's another aspect of it. But of course, also just what's going on in mainstream society, not speculating about the future. Above all, this diabolical agenda with the LGBT, LGBT stuff, this is all getting into the church with the synod. Oh my, there's just so, we've got Benedict gone. He could have stopped this in its tracks, but now he's dead. This catacomb, this restrainer removed, this, the, the wokeness is invading the church. And it seems like they are going to attack the fundamental moral law itself and the Eucharist through this synod, which is gonna reach its conclusion in 2024. Everything is converging on the years we're in right now. That was a lot of stuff, wasn't it? <laughs> a bit more than you know, I, I can say that, that, of course, Satan uses all kinds of very, very clever tools, and he's introducing them constantly and putting them out there, you know, and so we have to be very careful, like you said, about, you know, how we're using these technological things that we have. But, you know, um, the other thing I wanted I wanted wanted to say though, because you, you talked about it the other day with with um, Mark on Countdown to the Kingdom, um, all of these things we have to remember. You know, the 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 Senate uh, got uh, put off until twenty twenty four. 
now now we're hearing 2024 because um, these things can be mitigated. This isn't everything isn't a foregone conclusion because our lady keeps coming and asking us, she keeps warning us, but she keeps telling us, you know, pray, 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 pray. Be faithful Catholics, be faithful to the to the church. Live in the divine will, live in God's will because these things can be mitigated. And maybe, yes, maybe it's not something that could be um, eliminated. Maybe, you know, this is in God's, God's permissive will and it's always good for us. It's, it's always, in the end, it's good for us. We wouldn't be allowing something that's going to be harmful in the long run. But uh, we can mitigate these things. And so um, we must keep praying and remember that, um, but be aware, you know, we have to be aware because uh, uh, they're very, 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 very clever and it's very seductive. All of these things that are coming that are, you know, um, oh, well, we've, we've learned this and we've learned that and now we have this and now we've had that. And now we can run our vacuum cleaners off our phone and you know, I mean, uh, these things are very, very, in in many ways, so sophisticated and so seductive that we don't even realize we're being sucked right in. We get wrapped up in the thing how cool it is, and yeah, it's exactly. just like, yeah, like I like some years ago, I spent all this time trying to program a smart light bulb, and then I was like, and I then I realized, wow, I, I've got a switch here. I can just turn it on whenever I want. <laughs> this is awesome. This is yeah. amazing. A switch on my wall. I don't have to get an app or anything. So yeah, but but people are getting more and more addicted to this stuff. You you go, I won't just give another rant that you've heard a million of them about just this ubiquitous smartphones and people can't even talk to each other anymore. You go to a restaurant, everyone's just looking at their phones. But we're more and more living in a false reality. It's almost like that movie Wally, where just everything you're just looking at a screen, and it's just and you're just being carted around on some device. But, but yeah, we're we're getting seduct. We're it's completely seductive, and that's the right term to use here. Because if we stop to think about it, we'd, we'd be able to oppose it rationally. But that it's it's not a rational argument that's presented to us. It's a seduction. It's just this it drawing us into evil through our temptations. But uh, but especially what you said about mitigation that's so important. I'm always reiterating it so i'm sorry if i'm boring whoever's listened to me recently but yeah we can't you know there's we can't become we can't have our head in the sands on the one end of the spectrum and just ignore what's reality we ignore the signs of the times on the other hand we can't become fatalists now a few things are certain it is certain the chastisements are coming and the and the hour of peace is coming after them that's absolutely certain the details can always be mitigated by our prayer and fasting and that's like the last message of Medjugorje was so important this was just yesterday Actually, she said, um, and I'll just, I mean, I guess I could read the whole thing. It's only a few sentences, or I could just focus on a couple of parts here. I don't know what we have time for, as usual. Yeah, if you can read the whole thing. We haven't okay. presented it on our channel yet, so it'll be okay. great if you can read it. I'll read oh, this here. We've sure. got time. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, um, she, she gave this message to Marija on January 25th, just yesterday. Dear children, pray with me for peace because Satan wants war and hatred in hearts and peoples. Therefore, pray and sacrifice your days by fasting and penance, that God may give you peace. The future is at a crossroads, because modern man does not want God. That is why mankind is heading to perdition. You little children are my hope. Pray with me that what I began in Fatima and here may be realized. By prayer and witness peace, by prayer and witness peace in your surroundings and be people of peace. Thank you for having responded to my call. Now, this, I believe, is an extraordinary message. You know, anyone who's followed Medjugorje knows that she, Our Lady's messages there tend to be very gentle and they're not as, I don't know, they're not generally as apocalyptic, you could say. That's definitely the undercurrent of them, and especially if you go back to when they began in the 80s. But, um, it's not like every message is as intense as like Gisela Cardias tend to be, for example. Mm -hmm. But this message, Our Lady is saying, she's warning about war again. Satan wants war. The future is at a crossroads. Like we are now standing at that fork in the road. And where we go right now is, is, is not certain. It, it hinges upon us. Why? Because the modern man does not want God. This is, uh, this is the apostate age we're in. This universal rejection of God. 
and what and what does that mean? It means that humanity, mankind, is heading to perdition. We are heading to hell right now. And I say we, speaking in the general, most general sense of the word, the w- word, the world. We are rejecting God in ways so fundamental that if you posited this to someone just a few decades ago, they'd have laughed at you and said, mm-hmm. "That's that's impossible. Society could never fall that low." So. Mm-hmm. The, the, you wouldn't be believed. And yet here we are. And not only is it how it is, you are increasingly going to be persecuted if you even disagree. Where he, mankind is heading to perdition. So wh- what is what is the uh, takeaway here? That what I began in Fatima may be here realized. What did Our Lady warn at Fatima? That it's hitting the fan. That various nations will be annihilated. But above all, that her immaculate heart would triumph. She requested prayers, praying the rosary every day, going to confession at least once a month, you know, the first Saturday devotion. Don't just do it for five. Do it perpetually. That's what I beg you to do. It's it's not like every Catholic is doing their five first Saturdays. So we got to make up for all those who aren't doing any of them, but doing them perpetually. And that means confession uh, within eight days of a first Saturday, rosary, 15 minutes meditation, offering your communion on the first Saturday itself in reparation to her immaculate heart. And that's how we can nudge, at least, nudge us towards the right side of this crossroads that we're at right now. There's going to be chastisements, that's certain. Whether that will include specific things like nuclear war, World War III, that's not certain yet. But we absolutely must realize that that's looking increasingly likely. You know, we were talking before the show a bit about some people would say, oh, no, World War III can't happen because uh, Our Lady said that it wouldn't in the 80s or the 60s. That was specific to the context of that day. So when Our Lady uh, apparently said, I don't even think this was part of an official message of either Garibaldi or Medjugorje, but that the Third World War wouldn't happen at that time. In other words, the Cold War, as everybody was rightly concerned, that would turn into World War III. She said, no, that's not going to happen. And indeed, that prophecy was vindicated. The Cold War did not become World War III. That, that prophecy was already vindicated. We're past the, we are past the scope of that prophecy temporally. We are way beyond that. In fact, Our Lady said in Medjugorje within the last couple of years, the world is at war. So she basically completely contradicted the view that would say that, oh, there can't ever be a World War III because Our Lady you know, said in this specific context that that wouldn't become World War III. You got to really have your head really deep in the sand to think that World War III is somehow impossible. You, you got you to gotta get out of that mindset. I'm sorry, that's just ridiculous. I mean, even Pope Francis has repeatedly said we're already in it. And he's right. We are actually probably already in World War III. The only the question is not whether there will be World War III. That already started. It might have even started on New Year's Day of this year. Uh, maybe we can get into that soon. But but we're in it. The only question is, is this going to become all out nuclear war? And that's looking more and more likely by the day in terms of the signs of the times. But God can, he's omnipotent. He will always be omnipotent with our prayer and fasting. He can prevent that. And let's please pray and fast like never before. And everything else, evangelize, proclaim the divine mercy, the divine will. Nuclear war would be a particularly terrible chastisement. Let's just do our best to avert it. Let's do our best uh, through prayer and fasting to avert it, while at the same time being honest about what appears likely in terms of the signs of the times, that happy middle ground. Honesty, but also trust. Neither head in the sand nor fatalism. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, it, it, it is what it is, and what's what's coming is coming. But if mitigation is possible, if we can, you know, if this can be staved off for how, however, through our prayer, through our fasting, through our um, our fidelity and perseverance, um, that just means more souls are saved. And mm-hmm. this is what God is interested. In. This is this is what He wants. He wants. He wants every soul with him, every, every soul with him. And um, the more time, the more souls. And mm-hmm. um, uh, and hopefully, obviously, as things escalate, people have a harder time keeping their head in the sand. Right. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm just making this point that uh, it, it's all, you know, in God's permissive will, it's all good. Mm-hmm. It, it happens in a way that he, he wants, but we have our part to play too. And I think that this yeah. message again from Medjugorje is very um, significant in the fact it's just like you said, 
um, they're usually pretty, you know, uh, gentle. Uh, dear children, very gentle. Um, and she is sort of ramping up a little bit in her, her messages. Yeah. Yeah. I've long yeah. felt that when Met, when Medjugorje starts getting real apocalyptic, that's when we'll know it's here. Yeah. And it seems yeah. like that's what's starting. And that's, like that's happening. Yeah. For, yeah, sure. That's, for sure. And we, of course, know the Medjugorje, there's the promise that will be warned not long in advance, but a few days in advance before the secrets themselves actually happen. But that could be very soon. That could be any day, really. Right. I mean, with as long as, you know, within three days, I suppose we'd get the warning, but the war not the warning itself, the warning that the time of the secrets is starting. Um, yeah. But this, this. Well, uh, Mariana um, recently said that um, the times of the. <clears throat> And secrets are, are coming soon. I think that was a public mm. statement that she made. Really? Yeah. When was that? Well, and I've not not very long ago she said that. Yeah. 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 And I've I've met Father Petrar in person. He he's prayed over me, which was a really beautiful and powerful mm. experience. And he he's not young. Um, so if all of this is true, which I believe that it is. If it's going to be in his lifetime, that's not very long from now. I mean, you're looking 10, 20 years tops. I mean, he was, mm. he's not young. So, mm. um, yeah, I mean, I think just from that simple perspective of if all of this is true, like just logically, like it's going to happen in the next 10, 20 years, if not sooner. Mm -hmm. um, so wow. I think another thing that, that stood out to me too, Daniel, when you were talking, something that I like to say is how the kingdom of man is crumbling and the kingdom of God is coming. And I think that's what we're seeing. Like when people are not choosing God, it's because they've already chosen their God. They've chosen their smartphones and their technology. They've chosen sports. They've chosen sex, drugs, alcohol, all of this other stuff. We're, we're living in a time of so many idols and putting other things before God, in my opinion, more than ever before. I mean, talk about golden calves. We have millions of golden calves today. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we're, we're living in a time where people have chosen their God. It's just not the God. And I think God in his permissive will, he's allowing the kingdom of man to crumble so that people stop clinging to it. They're going to have to cling to his kingdom or they're going to fall with the kingdom of man. I think that has mm -hmm. to happen. I think that's why he's allowing it to happen. Uh, so that was just something I was thinking when, when you were speaking. But Absolutely. And Jesus, Jesus says something to Louisa, like, I will let them touch with their own hands what it means to live without their God. Like he will... We're we're in we're still in the era now of kind of natural chastisement. You know, we haven't seen like the three days of darkness. The Antichrist himself isn't reigning publicly yet, but we're reaping what we've sown. So the wind reap right. the whirlwind. We have ab abandoned God, as as you said, Christopher. We've got our idols, and almost everybody is implicitly worshiping something other than God right now. And That's it's right. um and the list you gave is quite accurate with what people are worshiping today. So we're we're reaping what we've sown, and we're seeing society crumbling. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in ways that we were always assured could never happen. Oh, we could never have hyperinflation of the U.S. dollar. That's the world's reserve currency. And that's, this is where we've only seen a fraction <laughs> of us coming. We could never, oh, the major world powers, they wouldn't be so reckless as to actually rattle their, you know, sure, North Korea might make, make a, a fuss every now and then. But, you know, the major powers like Russia and America, they would never come close to World War III. And then suddenly it's being openly threatened. I mean, all these things we were always told would never happen. They're happening in front of our eyes. And they're the result of our apostasy from God. So we still have a little bit more left in seeing the results of this. But this is all, as you were saying before, Debbie, part of God's permissive will. I love the quote, and Jesus tells Louisa that, I'm not worried about the buildings. Wasn't everything destroyed, the flood, and yet it was all built again? What I'm worried, what I, my concern is entirely for souls, because if they're lost, it's forever. Nothing can give a soul back to me after it's lost. So he tries everything possible to save a soul from damnation. And he saves chastisements for his absolute last resort because he doesn't want to see, he doesn't want to see us suffer. He certainly doesn't want to see us suffer in eternity above all, but he doesn't even want to see us suffer temporally. He tells Louisa, I would eviscerate myself. I would turn myself inside out to not see my children suffer. And yet when I do so, it is pure love because he says, all but the most perverted, all but the most perverse souls, when they really have to suffer the chastisements, then they come back to me. So he's going to try that. He's going to, and I always beg God whenever I see, whenever I read the news of any disaster, please don't ever read the news just out of morose delectation or curiosity. Do so so that you can intercede. I and mean, don't read the news too much. That becomes a distraction. But when you do, 
it, always pray with always offer intercessory prayers when you're when you're checking the news whenever i, I read of some disaster or natural disaster or other otherwise i always beg god to please as much as possible spare souls spare death and serious injury but but shake souls out of their apathy bring them to conversion and repentance and bring them back to you that's because that's why he allows these things and they're just going to get worse and worse and worse and more severe as the months and the year as the months uh, as we look ahead it's going to get there's going to be way more he's allowing that to bring souls back to him and you need to be there as an intercessory prayer warrior to to facilitate that with your prayer and fasting as our lady says here and we should also Absolutely. always go to the fact checkers, eh, uh, Daniel? The fact checkers What's on that? the news, they'll, they'll, t- they'll tell us the oh, truth. Right. <laughs> right, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Fact yeah, we're going to have news. more and more the of them. News, um, fact checked. It's mm-hmm. on TV, it must be true. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> on CNN, it must be true. Right. <laughs> I know. But, you know, that really is that really is the bottom line, isn't it, Daniel? God loves us. He wants to save us. He wants us with him in eternity. This is just a pit stop. <laughs> and um, it, it is in God's permissive will. And he'll get our attention in any way that he has to get our attention. Um, just like any parent would grab their kid's arm and jerk them back on the sidewalk if they ran out into the street and they wouldn't be terribly concerned about how if it hurt their arm when they pulled them back out of the street they'd be more concerned about getting them out of uh, you know the the danger and um uh so i i you know you mentioned in um when your blog you were talking about and i encourage everyone to read daniel's blog um uh about pandemic and war, pandemic and war. And um, uh, these tend to get people's attention. This is what gets people moving, <laughs> attentive, um, is pandemic and war. And we've seen pandemic and may see it again, but you right. know, now we're on the cusp of war. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, we saw that in the 20th century, certainly, you know, World War, the, the great wars, the two world wars, obviously, we all know about them, but we tend to forget that the pandemic after, you know, of course, we can't go into too much details here on YouTube, but the pandemic we've seen, the, the tyranny there is more in response to it than the virus itself. But but in the in the 20th century, World War I, it, it, more people died from the pandemic after that than World War I itself. So the, what we saw in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, I think we're seeing the, that was all almost like a, a, like a, a um, kind of a, smaller version of what we're about to enter into now what we are already starting what we are already starting to enter into now with uh with pandemic certainly but that itself being more of a laying down of the infrastructure of the antichrist although i want to put up a post soon and i hope i get to it that where it's called the devil's war games you know i referred I, i'm not sure can't read exactly what's being scrolled through there right now but recently i talked about and they might be in this post i can't is this the it's most recent one that's recent. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just scrolling I, down for people I, to have a look. I can't remember if I talked on this one about the infrastructure of the Antichrist and the devil's dress rehearsal, but that's what I think happened in the last couple of years. It's almost like the devil is laying down his infrastructure for the Antichrist. And we talked about that already with the central bank digital currency and smartphones and everything. Um, then there's a couple more things he needs before the infrastructure is fully in place, especially universal internet connection. Now, I, I wrote about this in 2018, actually. I said, I think the Antichrist is waiting before making his public entrance, he's waiting for global internet access because that's how it's going to have to work through the smartphone and then the chip. And I was always, you know, that back then I did a bunch of research and Google was making all these blimps. And I was thinking, okay, Google, the Google blimps, they're, they're going to be what makes the universal internet access. That's a thing of the past now. They abandoned that. But now we actually are on the cusp of universal global internet access through Star- Elon Musk's Starlink. We're almost there. Anyway, sorry. Just, uh, but, um, what I want to do is write another post called The Devil's War Games, because the devil, remember, the devil is not omnipotent. He's not all knowing like God. He's insanely intelligent. Yes. And he has access to what's going on materially in the world, but he doesn't know the future perfectly. And he can't even read our minds. In fact, no, no one can. Nothing can read your mind except God, actually. No, no technology, no demon, not the devil himself. But the. Um, 
So he almost needs to kind of learn and fine tune and perfect his own strategy before his definitive attack against the church through his minion, the Antichrist. And I think he used the tyranny of the last few years to perfect that strategy. And here's one thing I speculate that he learned from that. I think he learned that there are too many people who will catch on to his plans eventually and that he's got to move faster. And I think that the next tyranny, whatever it is, in whatever in the name of whatever made up threat it happens under the banner of, I think it's going to explode out of nowhere very quickly. And your head is still going to be spinning before your, you know, before your faith is outlawed practically. So that's why I think this window of opportunity is so important. It's not going to be this slow, steady increase of persecution over months and months and months. I think it's going to be just an explosion mm -hmm. of persecution of the faithful. So that that's going to be the time for us to go underground. And I think God, and I'm not asking anyone to do this right now. I'm certainly, I would never ask anyone to do something like this on my exhortation. You got to discern the will of God and wait until he makes it clear to you what to do. But I think the time is soon coming when it will no longer be possible for us to operate in the open. Christian, the Christian moral law and even the Christian faith, faith in Jesus, that'll be just outright outlawed soon. And right now, in most places, you know, in, in North Korea, it's not legal in other countries like that. But right now, you can still basically do this stuff out in the open. The time is going to explode out of nowhere where you can't. And that's going to be the same time. Remember, the devil above all wants to attack the Eucharist because that's God himself. That's Jesus Christ. He wants to eliminate the Holy Sacrifice. That's also prophesied not only in Scripture but in private revelation. That, how do you, I talked about this you know, on my web, webcast with Mark recently, but how do you eliminate the Holy Sacrifice? You've got to, you've got to invalidate either the form or the matter of the Eucharist. Both of those are absolutely set down by Christ in public revelation. The church has no authority to modify the words of institution, this is my body, or the matter of the Eucharist or the minister, which can only be a Catholic priest, which can only be a man. Um, so it's got to be, this is my body. It's got to be wheat bread. It's got to be, it's got to be a, a validly ordained Catholic priest, minister, matter, form. If those are substantially removed or modified, you no longer have the Eucharist. And if you no longer have the Eucharist, you no longer have the mass. And I believe that that also is coming through this synod of synodality, unfortunately. And that, but then God will always provide. He's always going to provide for the remnant, those who truly strive to do, to know his will and to do his will. He will give you, he will give you the grace and the opportunities to go underground at that point. There will always be Jesus promised that his church will persevere until the end of time. That is an absolute promise. Doesn't mean that it'll always be able to function in the open. Of course it won't during the times of the Antichrist, but it will persevere underground. You got to, you don't fret. Don't spend a bunch of time worrying about how exactly that's going to happen. God will provide. For now, we take advantage of the circumstances God has given us. That's right. And I loved what you said, Daniel, about, um, you know, building your network. When we're talking mm -hmm. about the church, going underground um, to, to build our network of faithful, strong Catholics that we can bond with and cling to and... Uh, we can help one another because that's going to be extremely important. I mean, when you look at the Christians, because that's what we're facing. When you look at the Christians of the earliest times, how they bonded together, how they they helped one another, how they networked with one another and uh, communicated with one another. And, um, you know, this is going to be something that we're going to have to at some point uh, get pro get proficient at. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 having our spiritual needs met and being able to do it very quietly and very surreptitiously so that, you know, we're not, we're not going to be able to be out in the open. And so to know that you have the strong foundation of, of faithful friends, faithful comrades, really, that you yeah. can depend on. Is going to be really important. These are things. And, you know, when we talk about this, you know, of preparation, um, you know, and I always, of course, as I say constantly, we talked about this before, you know, pray for perseverance, pray for knowing how to prepare, how to prepare ourselves, not only physically, God, you know, we can prepare ourselves physically, God will provide our needs as well. But preparing ourselves spiritually is, you know, this is what we need, we need to um, 
have our have our ducks in a row because as you said when this happens it's going to it's all going to come down like a ton of bricks on your head it's going to be mm -hmm. very fast and, and your, um, your head's going to be spinning if it's not on straight right now exactly <laughs> exactly yeah. because you're going, be, you're going to be blindsided possibly and it's going to be very easy to lose your focus and lose you know lose your equilibrium and so mm -hmm. i think that the stronger we have uh you know uh, uh, have fasted prayed and built ourselves up spiritually but also built up our 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 our, our, li our own little army maybe in your own little community <laughs> Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we need, you know, we're community. We, we need other people. We can't go at it alone. And no. if circumstances make it absolutely impossible for you to commune with other devout Catholics, then God, God will always provide what's necessary. The grace, if you're will doing his will. the grace will always be there. But if at all possible for you, you really need to try and, and be close with other devout Catholics who you're physically close with. Like you, you gotta, we are incarnate creatures. We can't only be digital. We can't only be on the phone. You know, we, we, we need other people in person. That's why the mass confession, like it'll, it'll never be teleconfession. It's got to be the priest absolving you right there. It'll always be in person. That's that's who we are. That's that's how grace operates most powerfully. So to, how do you find other devout Catholics? Well, first of all, be, make sure you are, are a devout Catholic. Um, and, and then, and then <laughs> so maybe get that checked off first. And then, uh, and then well, <laughs> you'll find that's that's yeah we forgot about that part. But um, and then go to um, I can't remember if I talked about this at all in, in the webcast and Mark, but you'll find the best people at perpetual adoration chapels at daily. Med. Don't talk in, in church during mass or after mass. Let people pray, but outside of the church after before mass, daily mass, Sunday mass. Sure, you'll meet good people, but you also meet a lot of people who have no interest in, in the faith. Really, they're just checking off their box. They're, they they don't even believe in half the dogmas, and but still meet people. Then yes, uh, praying outside of Planned Parenthood, we meet the best, the, the best of the best there. But you got to build this network of people. Signs at the times aside, you know what's coming down the pipeline aside. That's what we need for its own sake, that yeah. you, you need that community of devout faithful because uh, you'll build each other up in the faith. But yes, you'll also need it even more so moving down. So there will be and, and that group, they'll know certain priests who will always say the mass validly, no matter what. And those will be the underground masses. We'll always have these underground masses, even when the mass itself is outlawed legally or outlawed by by the Vatican itself, perhaps, by by the synod changing the words of consecration to invalidate or something, who knows. But um, I, Christ's promise that the church would persevere till the end of time, that the gates of hell would not prevail against it, that includes the mass. So you'll always be able to get that one way or the other. There may be times where you can't, but it will never completely cease. You'll always be able to find it somewhere. Um, so please uh, you know, be ready for that. In terms of yourself being ready, Yes, you'll need other people to be ready, but get your soul ready with, as I said before, monthly confession. I would also make an appeal, um, if any priests are listening, please make confession more available. You might not see a bunch of people at first, but I would beg every priest to make yourself available for confession before every single daily mass and yeah. Sunday mass, yes, if possible. But but like maybe no one will come before uh, at first, but it, word will get out and suddenly you'll be another John Vianney because the the need is there the people need it but so often it's priests just say okay 25 minutes on saturday maybe and that's it that's not enough you every single that, the mass and confession that's your that's your mission as a, as a when priest when people know that it's pray. available they will turn up you know when they know it's regularly mm -hmm. available they'll they'll start Going to right, more but often. you got to be reliable and and, and completely yeah. regular with it. When it's when it's regular and reliable, and you're always there, word gets out. Eventually, you'll you'll just have a, a line every single day. But that's that's so needed right now in preparation for the warning, and it'll also be good preparation for those priests who who for <laughs> for priests who will be in the confessional nonstop for weeks after the warning. Uh, but but you're going to need to get those souls ready now, who will be the ones out in the world, you know converting uh, evangelizing and getting people into the priest to to get the confession yeah i think people so easily forget that we are in the war in revelation 12 uh, between mm -hmm. her offspring 
and and the devils i mean that that's where we're at right now and people don't think about that or they easily forget that but it's it's so apparent if you think about this this is not just i mean yeah we look at a nuclear war in world war three that's horrible that's terrifying objectively but think of it infinitely times more terrifying is a supernatural war between heaven and hell over our souls we are what they are fighting over this battle has been going since the beginning of time and it's coming to a, a, a it's coming to a heightened point right now it's coming towards this climax and mm -hmm. and people just so easily forget that they think that life is just what it is this is just a matter of politics this is just a matter of foreign policy this is just a matter of oh well climate change or oh well once we get this new you know pipeline or whatever it's, it's infinitely greater than all of those things this is a supernatural war over our eternal soul and i mm -hmm. think another thing people forget is that where christ the head has gone we the mystical body have to follow so if christ went through the passion death and resurrection so will we his church go through it just like he did so yes of course the church it's never going to succumb to the evils right we christ himself promised that uh that the gates of hell will not prevail but it makes complete sense that we're going to go through death the resurrection um and there's going to be that momentary phase of of the tomb where the church is going to have to be underground for a bit. So it, it makes complete sense. And I feel like people so easily forget these things. Yeah. The symbolism is almost too perfect because like our Lord was literally right. in the tomb and the church will literally go underground in, in that church. Masses will literally be in basements where, where yes. we can't be seen through windows. So you have to put your phones in your, well, at this point, you'll have gotten rid of all that nonsense. But if you still have them, you got to put them in a Faraday <laughs> cage, something that blocks all signals. Maybe right. you can test out your fridge. It might work as one or it might not. But anyway, uh, that that time will come relatively soon. And this, yeah, this apocalyptic battle, this is already the most decisive battle you can possibly imagine. Pope St. John Paul II, he said that in the 70s. And, and we're, right. we're still in that same general era now, of course. It's coming to right. a head right now, what was going on then. He said, this is the definitive confrontation between Christ and the Antichrist, the church and the Antichrist, the gospel and the anti-gospel. This is it. This is the, and, and if, if this isn't it, okay, write for me a nice little fictional story about what you think it would be like when it is it. And tell right. me if you described anything other than today. I can't even, can, can anyone even imagine a society more primed for the definitive battle between Christ and Antichrist as now? I can't, like, you, it's very difficult to even imagine one, even if you were to write a fiction about it. So this apocalyptic battle that, of course, it's been going on since the garden. Absolutely. It's been having various iterations and, and, and crescendos. And, but this is the definitive one. This, this is we're in it right now. And it's above all, as Christopher said, a spiritual battle. The temporal ramifications of that are terrifying in their own right. Sure. But above all, it's spiritual and it's about souls. So you are engaging in that through your spiritual warfare for your own salvation and sanctification. Yes. But also for that of the whole world, you're engaging in this like a, like a frontline Navy seal. As I said earlier, when you walk out your door, when you go out, when you go out into the world after mass, having received the Eucharist, try to do it every single day. If you can receive the Eucharist and you bring the Eucharist out into the world as, as a, as a Eucharistic procession, like our lady after the annunciation, Pope Benedict said that was the first Eucharistic procession the visitation when Our Lady went to visit Elizabeth. And Jesus, Our Lady tells Louisa, I didn't go to pay her, a simply to pay her a visit. I went because I had a burning desire to bring Jesus to others. So that he wants, she wanted to bring him, who she knew was in, in her womb, to Elizabeth. We need to have that burning desire to bring Jesus to the world, who we are so privileged to receive in the Blessed Sacrament. We need to be overwhelmed with that desire and act upon it. Mm. Amen. Amen. Daniel, we've got around, um, not sure of how much more time you've got left, but um, it'll be great if we can just um, show some of the comments and questions from our viewers sure. live and get, get you to to answer some of their comment, their questions and comments. So if anyone from, that's watching would like to make um, a comment or uh, we'll ask a question. Uh, and I noticed to, uh, some on the screen button. earlier. Sorry, I didn't. I wasn't able to really see all, all of them, but I think you were putting. Yeah, them. yeah I was. Yeah, um, there's there's a lot. So we've got a lot of people <laughs> tuning in tonight, which is great. Almost nine hundred. And I talked way more than I meant to today. I apologize. <laughs> oh no, no, no. Well, that's why you're here. 
That's why you here today. <laughs> yeah, but you guys have way better things to say than I do. I'm just a knucklehead from New York. Yeah. We're all knuckleheads. It's okay. <laughs> oh, it's all good. So here's the first question. Is it wrong to ask questions about things you don't understand? Absolutely not. No, faith was the fra <laughs> the common proverb. I can't remember what saint it's from, but faith seeks understanding. So we faith, and I, this is such an important distinction. Oh, questioning is good and healthy and fine because you always want to understand more about your faith, but never doubt. This is a fad in the church today. And unfortunately, this fad goes up to the highest levels of the church. You'll, you hear it in the homilies all the time. Even bishops, Pope, unfortunately, said, oh, doubt is great. It's wonderful. No, doubt is is intrinsically evil. It's the opposite of faith. You know, the supernatural virtues, faith, hope, and love. Don't ever succumb to the opposite of any of the supernatural virtues, namely hatred, despair, or doubt. So never doubt your faith. Never, ever doubt a single element of the deposit of faith. Those are absolutely certain. I assure you, as a philosopher whose job is to search for the truth, no matter what, no prejudice, no preconceptions. I absolutely assure you 100% every single piece of the deposit of faith is certain and true. Don't ever question it. Don't, I'm sorry, don't ever doubt it. But yes, questions are good. They're fine. They help us understand more. And temptation, is what, what temptations are foisted upon you externally, that's not up to you. That's not a matter of your will. Your, your only answer for what you choose to do. So if you are tempted to doubt, that's fine, as long as you fight that temptation. And sometimes you fight that temptation by asking questions and by uh, exploring more, and that's fine. But so if, if you get tempted to doubt, fight that, sure. Sometimes that fighting will be through questioning, seeking more understanding. Just never actually think that doubt itself is good. It never is. It's always a trap from the devil, doubt. Next comment, the only things. way to the Father is through the Son. Amen. Got to stop thinking that all these other ways are just different paths. Of, you know, I was teaching comparative religion today at, at college at, at, at um, over where I teach at, at uh, SUNY. But um, and I, I and look, I, it's not like I can be preaching uh, homilies there or something to, to a, um, I teach at a secular public New York college. So when I'm teaching comparative religion there, I'm not exactly uh, speaking to just a bunch of seminarians or something. But I told I was very clear to even them. We can't, we're starting this course now, look, exploring all the teachings of the various religions academically here, but we can't just pretend that these are all different paths up the same mountain. They're not. And uh, Jesus was very clear that this, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and don't ever let a single, don't ever forget this, no one comes to the Father except through me. That doesn't mean we consign all those who, through invincible ignorance, are not Christians. It doesn't mean we consign them all to hell. Of course not. The point is that whoever makes it to heaven has only made it there through Jesus Christ. And he offers, at the, he assures St. Faustina and the servant of God, Luis Picaretta, that he comes to every soul at the moment of death to offer them a last chance. And anyone who's in heaven, it's only because they accepted the divine mercy of Jesus Christ. So what do we need to do now? We need to prepare souls to accept the divine mercy. That's the best way to evangelize in and of itself, but it's also the best way to prepare souls for death, and it's the best way to prepare souls for the warning. Proclaim the divine mercy. Get people ready. Soften their hearts to accept the mercy of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, and, and um, you guys have some anything. of our viewers are not some of our viewers are not Catholic, um, Daniel. So I think that question had some some you know other reference to to mary mm -hmm. sorry yeah the only way to the father or yeah yeah oh so, so for for those that are not catholics they, they kind of quote that a lot to say that we don't need mary oh right you know what let me uh let me see if i have my I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm looking for something right now. No, it's okay. <laughs> they, they just get a they get a good picture of Mary while in the meantime. Oh yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> There's a little bit of chatter going on in the comments. She just wanted the spot over a little bit. That's good. Yeah, I, I, got... I can't find it. But what did what was one of the final words of Jesus on the cross? You know, as Catholics, and I talked about this in the uh, the introduction of my my book, Thy Will Be Done which I'd recommend for Protestants also. I think I've heard from a number of Protestants who said this was life-changing for me, even as a non-Catholic. 
the Catholics take every single word that Jesus Christ said in the gospel absolutely seriously. Mm -hmm. And there's a high, everything Jesus said is absolutely infinitely important. But even within his sayings in the gospel, there's a hierarchy. I would say the greatest is the climax of the Our Father, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But also among the greatest are, of course, this is my body. That means this is that he means what he says there, the Eucharist. And then in John 6, he says, you must eat my body and drink my blood. But with the Virgin Mary, you really think he was only talking to St. John when he said, behold thy mother? You really think that was just a little comment to one guy not meant for anybody else? And yet it, it made its way into this into the gospel as one of his final words in the cross before he died? Of course not. He said that to John as a stand-in for the whole church. She is our heavenly mother. What is the fourth commandment? The first commandment with a promise, as Paul says in scripture, honor thy father and mother. How can you possibly claim that you are following the commandments without honoring your heavenly mother? She is your mother, whether you like it or not. The grace to inhale your next breath is coming from her hands. She didn't create the grace. Only her son can do that. But she mediates all of it. And even if you're blaspheming her right now on your lips, she's giving you the grace to inhale that breath that you used to, to speak those blasphemies. And she'll forgive you if you repent. She's, she's, she's so merciful. But please, just stop that. She's your mother. You can't change that. You don't get to choose who your mother is. God chooses her for you. And she's chosen her as the mother of everyone. And everything, every honor that you give to Our Lady, it's never a distraction from her son. Jesus gives Louisa this beautiful passage on how either they both just take as for them, they're equally pleased by any honor given to either one of them. You're never detracting from our Lord by honoring our lady, as long as you do it in an orthodox way, of course. We, can't, we don't worship her. We don't claim that she's right. divine. But as long as you honor her in an orthodox way, that never detracts from Jesus. And anytime you honor Jesus, it never detracts from Mary. They are perfectly hand in hand. She is the woman of revelation and she is the woman promised in Genesis. So this is a, this is as important as you can possibly get. And, and just like say Maximilian Colby, I was just going to say, just like say Maximilian Colby said, you don't ever worry about loving Mary too much. You'll never love her more than Jesus did. Amen. And I think it's, it's such a simple yet profound quote. Mm. And what's our late, you know, think about this. What was the last thing our lady said in the gospels? Do whatever, whatever he tells you. Yeah. She right. always leads him, us him, to say, him saying from the cross, behold, thy mother was no more just for John. Then Mary right. saying, do whatever he tells you was just was for, for all of us. That's right. Right. Good point. That was for right. all of us. And she, we can't, any time you go to Our Lady, she will always bring you to her son. That's the point of her whole existence. It's everything for her. Bring her bringing people to her son. She's our greatest example. Daniel. And that she did his will. Yeah, right. she was the only. She was the only, the only person that did his human person. Whoever did his will always did his will perfectly. Yeah. That's so right. the next the question, mark Daniel. Sorry to interrupt. It's the spiritual meaning of the mark of the beast. So, what do you think about that? Like the spiritual meaning that it's not really yeah. going to be an actual mark, but it's just your works there. And your thoughts. Well, that's certainly true. It certainly has a spiritual meaning, and I always, I'm just constantly coming back to this. Just don't. I would just say, don't assume there's contradictions where none need exist. There's no reason the mark of the beast can't have a, a valid spiritual uh, understanding and a valid literal understanding. I'm sure it's both. <laughs> yes, the, the many people are spiritually adopting the mark of the beast right now through their intellect, head, will, or works, hand, and that by adopting this ideology, this godless apostate ideology of today, that's certainly a, a symbolic receiving of the mark. Definitely, I fully endorse that. But I also think it's quite obvious that there is a literal mark of the beast coming uh, and and revelation is far too specific for this to be intended to be a merely symbolic understanding and i always go back to you know if, think about the flood for example you've been lied to about this for a long time i'm sure you've been told it's just a symbol or a myth that happened the flood really happened there is no uh contextual there's nothing there, there there's no biblical critical approach we can use to interpret that passage to be merely symbolic but it is symbolic also it's as Peter says, it's symbolic for baptism. It's symbolic for a number of other things. So it's both symbolic and literal, the flood. There are many other things in Revelation, in the book of, that's of course Genesis, but in the book of Revelation, there's all sorts of things that are both symbolic and literal. The, the more, uh, kind of the more 
difficult almost a passage like that gets, the more valid interpretations it has. Like Revelation 20,000 years. You can take that as referring to the whole age of the church, as St. Augustine did, perfectly valid. But it's also a literal prophecy about a time of peace on earth, a reign of the saints, where Satan is chained, where he can't do anything on earth. And we don't want to say it's a literal thousand years because we don't know the time of the is Jesus' second coming. So we do have to take the duration symbolically. But in terms of it being a reign of God on earth, a reign of the saints on earth, that's literal. That's coming. So multiple valid interpretations. Take them both. Don't assume they're contradictory unless they are stated blatantly contradictorily. contradictorily. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, Father... Chris Allah recently mentioned that for every adoration, a demon is released on for every on abortion. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> for every adoration, sorry. for every abortion, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, that's wow. my, well, that's that um, again. <laughs> that makes sense. I, I haven't I haven't heard that myself, but I can't uh, can't deny it. That certainly would explain much of the increase in evil in the world with so many more abortions. And we know that the blood of murdered innocents cries out to God for vengeance. It's one of the four sins That's that right. cries out to God for vengeance. And right. this is graphic, but just the, the literal blood of unborn children that didn't disappear when the baby was killed in his mother's womb. That's, that's in the soil of this world somewhere. It didn't, it wasn't an, it wasn't, it didn't vanish. It's, it's in the soil somewhere literally crying out to God for vengeance. Mm -hmm. So, and I shouldn't say literal in the sense that it's, it's speaking, you know, audible things, but it's, it's truly crying out to God for vengeance. Right. Next question's about daily confession and, you know, why is it, why do you think it's necessary? What can people be mentioning every day, you know, on during daily confession? I, well, that's a lot of confession. Yeah. I'm sure you're giving your, I'm sure you're, uh, you're uh, giving your parish priest some headaches. If look, if you've committed a mortal sin every day, you better go to confession every day. <laughs> but, but if if you haven't if you haven't uh, committed a mortal sin, uh, I don't think you need to run to confession every single day. If you just if it was venial things, but I, I do recommend at least once a month. Um, yeah. But but yeah, if you've look, if you committed your Tenth mortal sin in a sing. I hope this doesn't happen, but if it did, if you committed your tenth mortal sin in a single day, just go back to confession. It doesn't matter how many times it was. God is always more than happy to forgive you. You can start your life again as many times as you have to, even if it's a thousand times from now to whenever you die. Like just, but God only cares. He doesn't care about the past at all, as long as you're repentant. He just cares about about what you're willing to do right now. Repent. And yes, that means you can't be a lie. You got to mean it when you repent and, and say you're acting contrition. You got to mean it when you say you're really going to try to not let it happen again. But as long as you mean it, God is always happy to forgive. But I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say there's any need to go to confession every single day apart from mortal sins. Yeah. And and on that note, Daniel, something that's come to me in prayer recently that was just kind of prompted once again was. You know, when when Christ was on the cross and he had the the penitent um, or the penitent, the repentant thief next to him, and he he looked over at Christ and he was like, "Christ, remember me when you go into your kingdom." What I'm thinking now, with with the warning, with everything going on in the world, what I find myself saying is, "God, remember me when you come with your kingdom." And and mm. there there seems to be this this really personal, unique connection there of. We are all that sinner on the cross. None of us, we, we deserve our punishment. We all deserve our punishment. And yet all we have to do is to ask him when he comes with his kingdom to have mercy on us. And he's begging us to do that. So that, I just wanted to share that. That's something that keeps coming to me is just like that thief of remember me when you go into your kingdom. We can say, remember me when you come with your kingdom to earth, your mm. kingdom come, your will be done. And so I just, I felt like, Someone that's listening or watching this just needs to hear that if they're in that spot right now where they can't access confession easily or they have a desire to go to confession and they're starting to, to feel and experience sorrow for their sins, um, just to encourage them to go to confession and to, to ask our Lord for his mercy. And that is, it's never too late. It's never too late to ask him, just like the thief on the cross. Yeah. 
Never so. too late, and it's never inaccessible. And please, whenever confession is possible and you, and you need it, go. But God's mercy can reach you instantaneously wherever you are, as long as your contrition is genuine. Jesus, remember me when you come. Can you think of a more consoling passage in all Scripture than that? Right. That this guy who, and you know, shoot, I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't say it because I can't remember now exactly how it's relating the gospel. But I think the repentant thief, he might have even been one of the one. I think they might have both been reviling Jesus earlier and. In the past, and I'm not certain on that, but 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 even after even if that was true, and don't quote me on it, although now it's on the internet. Um, but uh, even even if that was true, he still <laughs> repented at that last minute, and he said, "Jesus, remember me." So he was sorry for maybe he even did something so evil seconds, minutes before, but then he realized he said, "No, my punishment is just; his isn't." And if he knew even more, he'd know that Jesus was suffering for his own sins right there. Then he says, "Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom." And what does Jesus say? "You'll be with me in paradise." So right. simple. So easy, so accessible. Don't it is always a lie from the devil. When always a you lie. think you can't yeah. be forgiven. The devil always reminds you of God's justice before you uh ask, sorry, the devil, there's a quote, I don't know who it's from. The devil always reminds us of God's justice after we sin and of mm -hmm. God's mercy before we sin. <laughs> when it's supposed to be the <laughs> other way around. Think of yeah. God's justice when you're starting to think about sitting. But if you do unfortunately succumb to sin, think about his mercy after that. Always Amen. accessible. And all is forgivable. Daniel. All is forgivable. Mm -hmm. we, it, somebody, we made the comment about for every abortion, two demons are released. Or what, mm -hmm. There are women out there that think that they've had an abortion or someone that's been involved with an abortion that think they can't be for All can be forgiven. That's all right. Mm -hmm. forgiven. Through confession, through uh, penance, through we could all make reparation for whatever our sin is and all can be forgiven. Don't, don't ever think that you're beyond, you know, it's beyond the pale. You mm -hmm. can be forgiven no matter what your sin is. No matter what. Right. Any Amen. advice for those that are going through addictions, um, especially, you know, sexual addictions or thoughts that may lead them to, to feel that they need to go to confession you know, more than once uh, a week. Or yeah, a, um, a sexual, most sexual sin, so sexual sins, they are uh, among the, they're a category of sin that is always grave by definition. So if you've committed a serious sexual sin, yes, get to confession before receiving communion. And you can still go to mass, but, you know, go put your hands like that or, or just don't walk up to receive. It's still always worth going to mass, even if you can't receive communion. Um, but don't so so you know i'm talking about actual succumbing to like a fornication or something like that or, or, or deliberately viewing pornography or autoeroticism yes those are grave matters if, if you do that you got to go to confession before you receive communion but with when it's just um when it's just thoughts and stuff that you don't assume that something is a definitely a mortal sin unless you're confident of it you know padre pio even said good still receive communion unless you're certain it was a mortal sin and if if, if you fornicated or something like that you better believe that was moral um don't ever do don't please don't don't go down that horribly evil path but um the um and even jesus told louisa like that there was a soul who had extra time in purgatory because she would refrain from receiving communion because mm -hmm. of trifles. You would think, oh, I committed a, a I, I thought I had a bad thought about someone. I maybe said a little word I shouldn't have. I, 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 I got a little angry or something like those. Don't do, don't, yeah, those are sins. Don't let them happen. But, but unfortunately, they probably will continue to happen as we continue to grow in the spiritual life. And hopefully we get past those soon through, especially through living in God's will. But don't assume that those types of things prevent you from receiving communion or that you have to go to confession before receiving communion for those. Confess them regularly. Again, I advise at least once a month. More is, is great too, but don't feel like you have to go every day for stuff like that. I can't. I can't get into your soul and tell you what's you know what's mortal <laughs> and what's not. A priest will be much better. A good priest in spiritual direction or seeking advice from him after confession, he'll do a much better job than I could, guiding you into understanding what's mortal and what's venial and what should and should not prevent you from uh, receiving communion. And the catechism goes into really good uh, detail about mortal sins and what qualifies mm -hmm. as a mortal sin. So for well, those that are confused, I know a lot of people are confused, get confused about what's mortal and venal. I, I highly recommend reading that passage in the uh, catechism. 
Mm -hmm. I think there's yeah. like, and it boils down to grave part matter, part. full knowledge, and full consent. And, and yeah, so if those three are there, then then yeah, you know, go to confession before um, communion. And another another thing that just came to me real quick in regards to just repenting and and trusting in the Lord's mercy, it, it kind of reminds me that there's to a certain degree there was a similarity between Peter and Judas. They both betrayed Christ. They both denied him in, in their own way. But the difference was one accepted his mercy while the other despaired. Mm -hmm. And that I think there's something to that. I think there's something very profound to that, that while they both betrayed Christ, while they both denied him in a certain way, one accepted the mercy and the other one despaired. And so if you feel like you were one of them that is that has left him or that you've betrayed him, you've hurt him somehow or in many different ways, accept his mercy. Don't despair, but run to his mercy because he wants to forgive you. Yeah. Because as you are ruminating on, on a mortal sin you just committed, the devil is so active right there with his temptations of despair. And, you know, that was actually portrayed so well in The Passion of the Christ. Judas could have repented. He didn't, and, and now he's in hell, unfortunately. But he could have repented. But look at what the devil did right after he betrayed Jesus. He's attacking him and attacking him and attacking him. Like there's these terrifying images in The Passion of the Christ kind of illustrating the devil's attacks on Judas. And um, those were all, of course, uh, temptations to despair, even though Judas kind of had a, a type of remorse, but it wasn't repentance. He, he kind of said that this was, I shouldn't have done that and all that. He tried to give the money back and all that, but there wasn't the trust in the divine mercy, which is why St. Faustina's message is so pivotal for this time, uh, that, that that trust differentiates. It's, it's all, in, some, in some senses, it's the only thing that differentiates the elect and the reprobate those who trust and those who do not trust in God, mm -hmm. because we've all sinned except for our lady. And, and so the only the question is whether or not we trust that God can actually overcome that. That's right. I've got a bit of a um, difficult question and it's a topic that a lot of people are interested in. We probably could conclude on this topic, Daniel, it's about the three days of darkness. I know that you spoke a little bit about that with father Chris Allah. Um, would you be able to, to give us your pers perspective on three days of darkness before we wrap up our show? Yeah, that's you know, that three days of, of darkness. It's, um, yeah, people always have tons of questions because they want to make sure all the details <laughs> are fully prepared, that they got enough duct tape for all Get their, their beeswax. And all that. Yeah, beeswax. Yeah, beeswax yeah. Just, candles, got your blessed man. And, and I'm sorry, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry if this is flippant, but I just say, it's just, just, just stop worrying about the three days of darkness. It's, <laughs> I, I really don't think it's imminent. I, it doesn't make any sense for it to be imminent because there's all these other chastisements that have been prophesied. Right. It would make no right. sense for the three days of darkness to happen right now because then there right. would be like no human. I mean, yes, of course, humanity <laughs> yeah. would survive, but there'd be nothing left for all this other stuff that's been prophesied to happen. It makes no sense for it to happen right now. It's got to happen as the capstone of the chastisements, as, as the event that takes care of anything that wasn't taken care of before that. This coming of Christ to defeat the Antichrist, as um, St. Thomas Aquinas says, it's not a physical coming. This is not the end of time. This, this manifestation of his power, the breath of his mouth, as St. Paul says in Scripture, whether that happens immediately before or during or immediately after the three days of darkness, I don't know. But it would probably be the same general event. And it's this, I believe that it will, uh, the mystics have said, hell will be unleashed completely on earth, absolute darkness. The demons, I believe, they will they will be allowed to accomplish God's will through his permissive will. He's just letting them out. But even the demons are completely constrained by God's will. So they just, all they want to do is devastate and destroy and kill and slaughter. But you know what? They'll only be able to do that to those things that God gives them power over. They'll swallow up whole areas that I think are irredeemable, that, that will just have no place on earth during the kingdom of the divine will. I think they'll just swallow them up and bring them back to hell. All those who just have refused every single attempt after attempt after attempt of God to get them to convert and repent, those who just will have no part in it, they'll have to be removed from the earth. The three days of darkness will take care of anything that wasn't taken care of in the chastisements before that. Yes, have a blessed candle. I believe that's wise. I could be wrong, but it's possible three days of darkness are imminent. But remember... Um, that this is it's com God is in completely in control of this, and yeah, I think he want I think he's made it clear through the mystics that he wants us to have a blessed candle on hand, and in fact, it's a good idea to light a blessed candle generally while you're praying with mm -hmm. your family. That's a spiritually powerful practice uh, for its own sake. 
So if remember that the point is that the, the blessed candle will burn miraculously. You don't have to worry about having a bunch of them. Like you don't need to have 72 hours of beeswax candles for each room in your house and all that is miraculous. It, the, right. These will just stay lit and, and you'll be able to light them miraculously. So don't worry about how you're going to light whatever you light it with. It, this is just a channel of God's grace. Don't don't stress about all those things you hear about the demons mimicking voices outside and and should you open your door or not. God, just I would just encourage putting all that aside and not worrying about the three days other than sure having a blessed candle. Mm. Even though, yeah, I think they Thank I think you it's very really much. Good. Uh, before okay. we wrap up, um, okay, sorry, I apologize for my connection today. It's kind of a bit choppy, but um, I just wanted to remind everyone or let everyone know that next Thursday, this same time, we'll be having Mark Mallet on. So, so that all right. Be- Two weeks of <laughs> great guests. <laughs> I so, um, <laughs> yeah, you're you're invited if you're free, but you might, you might have some time to talk as well. <laughs> you're always invited, Daniel. Whenever. Yeah, I can't stop talking. I'm sorry. I just it just keeps just my mouth just keeps going. I have to well, to listen, to you. <laughs> the gift of gab, you know, the gift of gab. <laughs> I love it. That's good. Yeah, tune in next week um, for Mark. I'm happy to hear that he'll be on. Yeah, yeah. So that will be. We're very excited to have Mark on next week. It'll be I think it will be um, eight p.m. EST time, or or nine p.m. I'm not sure. What is it? Do you remember what it is, Debbie? I think. Well, it's going to be twelve. I think it was nine. Australia. I, I hope it was eight, nine. eight o'clock Eastern Standard yeah, nine. Time. I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll be um, one of those times. We'll be putting up a, a, a thumbnail soon and inform. Well, I think we just made it eight so, o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think his Seven, his time's a bit. He's gone. in Canada, so it might be nine nine p.m. Anyway, <laughs> thanks everyone for <laughs> for tuning in and joining us. We had a, a lot of views today, uh, live views over nine hundred now. So this is amazing, highest we've ever got. So thanks a lot, Daniel, for coming on again. And uh, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Honor's all mine. Great meeting you, Christopher. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Daniel. Likewise, it's an honor. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And we've had a few questions about living in the divine will. Maybe you can wrap up, Daniel, with a prayer on, um, you know, a prayer and a blessing. Not that you're a priest. But sure. You're a priest. Oh, yeah. Well, I just, I'll just, yeah, I mean, I can't bless, but I can pray with you. And I'll just say, yeah, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll just offer a quick prayer that um, anybody can recite any time to ask for God's will to reign in their hearts in the name of the Father and of the Holy, in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most Holy Trinity, I thank and praise you for this new day. Setting my will in yours, I affirm I want only to live and act in your divine will. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Amen. Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's so short. Amen. I intentionally gave you the shortest possible version. I love that Yes, one. there's a whole, conse- <laughs> whole consecration to the divine will. Yes, and I, I recommend them. But it's so Can simple. you it's repeat just, that one more time? It's just asking God's will to reign in your soul. And even if you don't remember that, you can just use any words you want to give Jesus your will and ask him for his will instead, because that's the heart of the Our Father. Thy will be done. That's the heart of the gospel, the fiat. Most Holy Trinity, I thank and praise you for this new day, setting my will in yours. I affirm that I want only to live and act in your divine will. Amen. Amen. The Provenient Act, you can start each day with something like that, asking for God's will to reign in your soul completely. Give him complete dominion every day, all day, and that's the gift in a nutshell. His will, not yours, be done. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, God Daniel. I'm going to pray for us. End our, uh, yes, definitely. We'll we'll hopefully see you again on our channel in the f- near future. Maybe. I would love to. I would and love we'll... to. Yes. Yes. And maybe, <laughs> in, 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 and, and maybe on, and maybe on in his will. Yeah, oh yes, go. yes, <laughs> indeed. I get a little plug in there. <laughs> make, make <laughs> Divine will. <kid>. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> we'll finish. We're going to be finishing off with a, a short, you know, advertisement from um, our new book. So this is our new book, which is here. We've got two books, Daniel. If you don't know, first one is Paeta, the Apocalypse, which is 
uh, a book of prayers that have been revealed to seers related to the end times. And this one we've just recently put out. It's called Spiritual Warfare um, Protection and Deliverance Prayers. And that's composed of a lot of prayers from saints. So great saints that have fought against the evil ones, such as uh, St. Benedict, uh, St. Anthony the Great, the Desert Father, St. Charvel, St. Padre Pio, St. Michael the Archangel, St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, our Queen and Mother, and precious blood prayers and various other saints and exorcism prayers so that's something that we've made up uh, in our book ministry our prayer book ministry so i'll put i'll finish off with with the video on that prayer book. god bless you everyone and thanks god again bless. for joining us welcome again to mother and refuge today we're pleased to recommend to our viewers our latest book in our prayer series Due to the popularity of our first book, Pieta of the Apocalypse, the team at Mother and Refuge have put together another fabulous book of prayers for deliverance and protection. We are thrilled to introduce the End Times Spiritual Warfare, Essential Prayers and Sacramentals for Deliverance and Protection. This is a 186 page paperback book with a unique blend of prayers, scripture, saintly words, and sacred art. This is surely to be a perfect addition to your library. The End Time Spiritual Warfare aims to equip the faithful laity and clerics alike with a collection of amazing deliverance prayers inspired by the great saints themselves. These saints are famous for their conquest over the evil one and his minions. They include the likes of Saint Benedict, Saint Anthony the Great, Saint Jabal, Padre Pio, Saint Michael the Archangel, and of course, powerful deliverance prayers dedicated to the terror of demons, Saint Joseph, and the Queen of Heaven herself, our Mother Mary. The book is also filled with other amazing invocations to be used by the laity, imploring the precious blood and the Word of God. Truly, this is a deliverance book that you must have. As always, we thank you for your prayers and support. God bless you.